eyes and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Okay, we're ready for Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. I hope that's where it is. I love, I love these kind of letters. Uh, I think I said when we first started Philippians, it reminded me a lot of James. Uh, there are some verses, some passages that are harder than anything in James, but um, I still like it so much because it, it just talks about everyday things that we're going to be faced with. And he talks to us, and of course I find this in most of the New Testament, that once you get out of uh, the Gospels, but uh, I find it it's just like just like he's just talking about yesterday or tomorrow. Uh, it's it's I, I think it's just uh, that clear and that purposeful, uh, Bonnie. With the statement you just made, that, you know, somebody has left the church and now they're going to the Baptist church. Uh, I wonder. <laughs> I wonder what, well, Paul does. He'll talk about some of that here today. But, hey, Debbie, um, can't you imagine Paul writing a letter when somebody in the Lord's church had, had left the Lord's church and gone over to denominationalism? That's about what we're studying at Pleasant Ridge on Sunday morning in my Sunday school class in the book of Hebrews. And, of course, I, I believe it's Paul that wrote it. Uh, I don't know for sure, but uh, I don't think anyone knows for sure. But, uh, like I said in the beginning, it's heartbreaking. It is absolutely heartbreaking. But we're going to see some tonight that uh, they were dealing with some of the same things that we deal with in the church and in their lives, uh, same things we deal with today. Uh, of course, it never changes. Uh, it, whatever was back then is today. It might have a different name, uh, but it's sin is sin, and it's it's there. And he tells us how to deal with it. He'll tell us how to deal with a lot of it tonight. Let's start in chapter two, verse fourteen. I'm only going to read uh, through seventeen. Uh, there's so much here that. I don't know if we'll get to the end of that. Paul says, and I remember, he's writing to the Church of Christ at Philippi. Uh, he's talking, he has already talked about him dying. Uh, he's wanting to make sure that they stayed faithful. Uh, it's, it seems to me like the Philippians must have been kind of an extra special congregation to Paul. They had helped him and helped him. Uh, I think they understood a lot more than some of the earlier uh, churches that Paul helped to start, that others started, but it seems to me like they understood more uh, about what the Lord wanted, what was expected to them, what the church was, than a lot of people did. And that probably made Paul be very uh, feel very special about those people, and uh, if we get that far, and I think we will get that far, he's going, he's going to show that care for them. Verse 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Hold forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Okay, back over to 14. Uh, I want to draw your attention first to um, verse 12. He says, 
Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, or not just while I'm with you, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I, I want to draw attention to that phrase in there. Work out your own salvation. That's what he's doing. That's what he's trying to teach them in these verses that we're going to study tonight. Each of these verses need to go back to that context. They need to go back to that subject of Paul telling them to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, we talked about it, uh, you know, a little before. Uh, these people that believe once saved, always saved. Once in grace, always in grace. How, I don't understand how they can read verses like this where he says, work out your own salvation. Uh, 20th chapter in the book of Revelation where he says, we are going to be judged by our works. Now that doesn't say we're going to be saved by our works. We're not going to be. You cannot, you cannot work hard enough. You cannot do enough. If everything you do is for somebody else. You can't, you can't do enough for it to save your soul. It takes more than that. And after you have been saved, it's still a great work that you're going to have to do if you expect to stay saved, if you expect to enter in. If you expect, and of course, uh, I, I know I was going to say, you know, I'll be satisfied. I'll be satisfied. What is it? I'll be satisfied with a, a cabin, cottage a cottage below. You know, not me. How about you? Now, I'm, I'm going to be so glad to be there, and I know I'm going to be there. But according to the scripture, those who have spent their time laboring for the Lord, doing what he has told them to do out, out in the field of harvest, trying to win others to Jesus, trying to call back those that have been lost. Those people are going to have some great rewards. I think that's what happens. I think when, I think when we are working out our own salvation like he talks about there in uh, verse 12. It's uh, someplace else he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That ought to tell us something. I believe that that's where the rewards, the amount of rewards that we are going to get in heaven, I believe that's what's going to, that, what we do is not going to, uh, what good works we do is not going to determine if we're going to be saved or not. But it is going to determine what rewards we can expect to get. And like I said, I am not going to be satisfied with a, would you say, a cottage, some cottage below? Uh, uh, with, uh, I want more than that. And I'm not saying I think I deserve more than that. I'm just saying according to God's word, if you read it the way you should, you can expect God to give you more. I mean, he has to be a liar if he's not going to do that throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament. It's not just, a, it's not just you get a free ticket to heaven when you lay your hand on the radio. They'd have had a hard time doing that in the Old Testament and the New. But... Uh, there's something to be done, folks. We just can't sit on our laurels and expect to be saved. Uh, we can't say, Lord, look at all I've done for you. What we ought to be able to say is, Lord, look at all I continue to do and I will continue to do. Uh, there's no... Th there's no... Salvation's free, but there is no free ticket to heaven and your rewards. You can, you can throw away all that you've gained. What's going to keep us from being saved? The lack of faith, not trusting him. Well, 
Is it any more faith when we are baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit? Does, is, does he expect that faith of us and then not expect us to do the other things he tells us to do in the New Testament? No. He's measuring our faith all the way through it. Okay. Now remember, keep in mind, they were told to... Uh, they were told in verse 12 uh, that they were to work out their own salvation. There's that verse, with fear and trembling. Now, in verse 14, notice what he says. You might miss this, and I don't want you to miss this. Paul doesn't want you to miss this. Jesus doesn't want you to miss this. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. See, this is why I called verse... Called verse 12 to your mind he's talking to them about how they can work out their salvation with fear and trembling uh, now when he says with fear and trembling he's simply saying this is not an easy task being different than the world is hard but that's what he's commanding us to do we must be different than the lost world around us so do all things. He doesn't say tithe. That's included. He doesn't say be patient. That's included. But notice what he says. Do all things. He's talking about everything you're going to find as a command to do. What Jesus say, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what he means when he says all things. Find those commandments and do them. There's another good job that if you want something to study through the week, uh, it'll take you more than a week, but, but find the commandments and do them. Start working on them at least. Find the promises. Find the promises. I have a New American Standard Bible that marks the promises, and it is full of them. From the Old Testament throughout the New, the promises that God has given to us. And remember, he never breaks a promise. Every one of them are just as true as true can be. So do all things without murmurings, now, when he says murmurings, he's talking about grumbling. And murmurings, this is a two this is a two-sided coin. Do all things without murmurings or without grumbling. And I think what he wants us to see here is this is an external command. As you live before the world, as you go to work, as you stay home and talk on the telephone, as you go to the grocery store, as you go to the assembly, whatever you do, notice it, notice the command again, do it all without grumbling. <laughs> Who's the supreme example? Jesus. What did he say? Father, if it's your will, go ahead and do it. He told God what he wanted, but he didn't gripe about it. He didn't grumble about it. I know a few people that all they do is gripe and grumble. Now, I'm talking about Christians that I know. I don't believe... If I wasn't a Christian, I don't believe if one of those people, they, yep, they usually don't do this, they're not that interested in Christ, but I don't believe I'd listen to one of those people trying to convert me to Christ. I want somebody that means business with the world. Is it our job to try to convert people to Christ? Just look at Matthew, the 28th chapter. There at the end of the chapter in what we call the Great Commission, we have been commissioned to win people to Christ. And he's saying here, without grumbling and griping, without, 
without being that kind of a person. Let me check my note. Uh, without murmuring or without grumbling, without murmurings and disputings. I got a little ahead of myself. It, it's true, but when I said external uh, reactions. When he says and disputings, that's, what's disputings? It's just, it's arguing. Some people just love to argue. We had a man in a congregation that I served, when we would have a men's meeting, you could count on him arguing about something in that men's meeting, something that didn't make any difference at all, but he wanted to argue. Usually people like that are people that want to show themselves. They want to show you that, hey, I can win this argument. And you know, people, people that, that, that win an argument, they're like, they're like somebody who's uh, won the battle but lost the war. Uh, it's just, it's not something we should be striving to do. So do all things without murmurings and disputings, or in other words, be like Jesus. Go ahead and bite the bullet. How many times, how many times do we find somebody saying, well, I won't put up with that. I'm not going to let them do that to me. And I'm not saying you need to let people pull the wool over your eyes and walk all over you. Again, go to Jesus. What did Jesus do? Remember, it said that he would not snuff out he wouldn't, he wouldn't break a fragile reed and he wouldn't snuff out a wick that was just about to go out. Jesus was so compassionate and so tolerant that even though he was always right, he still took what he needed to take to be the example that he needed to be. There was no doubt that he was strong. There was no doubt that he was bold and courageous. But I think, I used to try to raise my children, uh, the bigger boy, Mark, uh, Doug's pretty big now, Mark got picked on all the time in school, all the time, because he was so big and they knew his daddy would not allow him to fight. Now, if he was standing up for somebody else, that's different, but harassing, bullying, whatever it is. That's not how a Christian gets it done. I used to always try to tell them, which do you think takes the most courage? Fighting or not fighting? Usually it's not fighting because you don't want the peer pressure that's going to become, that's going to come when they all start to call you chicken or they all start to call you coward. Know yourself. Know your Lord. Know he knows you and just do what's right. He's telling them to stop this kind of stuff. And evidently, the way this is written in the Greek, we don't know who was doing it in the congregation, but we know some of this was going on from the way it's written in the Greek. It directs us to believe that this is a, this is a certain thing that is already happening. And he was telling them to stop it. And at the same time, he was telling them, if you're not doing it, don't start. One person can fill a congregation full of problems because people are going to follow one person a lot of times. Just be like Jesus. So do all things without murmurings and disputing that ye may be blameless. Let's add this to make it sound the way it should. Just remember, I say that because it's hard to take something out of the Greek and put it into English. Same thing with the Hebrew into English. I think if we start that verse with so, so that, or do all things without murmurings and disputing, and here's why he says, so that ye may be blameless. Now this is the external action that I'm talking about. The other is going to be an internal action that we're about to see. That ye may be blameless, or when that word be, that verb be in there, 
that also can be used as a become. And the become would have that famous uh, continuing action. So he's telling them, do all things without murmuring and disputings, that ye may become blameless. That would be above reproach. Uh, this would be something they should be doing as they were working out their own salvation. Tells an elder, it says for an elder that he has to be blameless. Does that mean he has to be without sin? No. We're all going to fall into sin from time to time. What that means is he needs to be above reproach. Nobody can point a finger and say, Steve, I got the goods on you. Not shouldn't be able to do that. If they point to some sin that some one of us has done, it should be a sin that we've already repented of. We're working on it. It shouldn't be something they can single us out and say, you have this sinful type of lifestyle. That ye may be blameless and harmless. Now, blameless was the outside reaction. Harmless, which also means sincere, or it means innocent. That internal attitude. Uh, in Matthew, the 16th chapter, and, I'm sorry, the 10th chapter, let's look there. In Matthew, the 10th chapter, and verse 16. Behold, Jesus says, I send you forth. He was sending the apostles out to win other people, tell them about the kingdom. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Or they're going to they're gonna try their best to eat you alive. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless or as innocent as doves. He had created every animal. He had created the birds. He, had, he knew what he was talking about when he said doves are harmless. I'd venture to say you've never seen one dove fighting another. Now they might, I don't know, I've never watched them all. But uh, when, I, when I hear a dove, do, do you have them in Madison too, that if you go outside you can hear, They've changed. Last year, they were over here from our house. Now they're down by the river. But I swear it's the same one. Uh, it's, <laughs> but I've got them at the farm. But even the sound that they make is so innocent, so unassuming. And that's what he's telling us to be. Outside, outside we need to be, what did I say? Outside we need to be no, blameless. And inside we need to be harmless. I heard, a, I heard something the other day about gentleness, one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It might have been in the Restoration Herald, I don't know, but it was really a good article talking about being gentle, and that's part of what he's talking here when he talks about being harmless. You know, I've, I've had I've had times, I had a time, Mike, I'm sure you remember, I got on you so hard once at Madison, and when I read this article on gentleness, I should have treated you a much different way than I did. Sometimes we get provoked. Sometimes we just want to show, we just want to show we're boss, and I, I don't know what it was, but uh, we need to be gentle to people. Uh, how are we going to win them to Christ? How are we going to bring them back if we're not gentle? So, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, or the way God's sons ought to be acting, the sons of God without rebuke, or again, above reproach, without rebuke, 
I'm searching for my notes. Got to hang with me a minute. Harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke. Let me see what number two says. I can't find number two. Anyway, let's go on. Without rebuke, uh, without, uh, what he means by rebuke is without reproach. And I've already explained that with blameless, uh, without reproach. Somebody can't come to you and say, I know you, you do this. This is part of your life. And it, it can't be. He's just saying this cannot be. If you're doing, if all you're doing is light drugs, um, all you're doing is light drinking, uh, I guess there would be no light adultery or fornication. But, you know, the world has accepted so much today as okay. But don't you know he's telling them right here, you can't go by what the world says. I don't care. I remember I used to date a little girl who could not go to the movies unless she checked with her Catholic priest to say if that was an A, B, C, D, or whatever kind of movie it was, and certain movies she was allowed to go to. Now, that was probably a good thing. Uh, but if that's the way we're going to... If that's the way we're going to grade our morality by what somebody else does, that's wrong. You can count on other, you can count on people that aren't of the world, for the most part, not agreeing with what the Bible says. Uh, if you don't believe that, you look at the Democratic Party, you look at that bunch of rhinos, you look at these people that are causing all these problems today. And I sure don't want them, I sure don't want them making up my mind for me. We don't have Fox at the camper. We've been, we've been having to watch uh, national news, uh, fake news. Now, I don't think a whole lot of what you get out of Cincinnati is, is going to be biased that way. I believe some of it is, but I even feel guilty when I watch the weather on one of those channels. You have to weigh everything. Uh, don't watch CNN at all. I don't care what. Just stay away from them. Uh, but you can't say what we used to do when our parents had, we'd come home and we had done something that they didn't want to do or we wanted to do something and they wouldn't let us and we'd say, well, everybody else is doing it. That ought to be reason enough that our parents aren't going to let us do it because everybody else is doing it. And I, I was the chief sinner in all of that. But praise God, I came to the Lord and got to see that a lot of these things are wrong. People who don't use the Word of God as the bottom line to their decisions are people that do it just like the rest of the world does it. We can't do that, and that's what he's telling them. He wants them to be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke. Now, here's what I've just been saying. In the midst, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Now, he says a crooked and perverse generation. They are, if, they're, if he's talking, when he's talking about the crooked, he's talking about people with perverse morals. <laughs> you think it just started with us? They had the same thing back there. Now, there's a good thing about that. I just said, let the Bible be your bottom line. If they were handling, if Paul is trying to handle the same things that we're going through today with them back there then, don't you think God knows what he's doing? That's because the Holy Spirit was responsible for the word 
He knew what was going to be happening today, so he gave them guidelines that we can go by here today. We can't say. We, we can't say the world is worse now than it ever was. Talk to somebody that visited Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't think we've seen it that bad yet. Not at least in this country. But it's bad. It's bad. And he said he wants them to be sons of God without rebuke in the midst or as you're rubbing shoulders with this crooked and perverse. Now, when he says perverse, he's talking about spirituality. He's talking about people that have a twisted spiritual outlook. He's talking about people that have a distorted view of what God's telling us to do to worship him. The world's full of them. I call it denominationalism. And I, I put the Muslims, the Hindus, I put every one of the rest of them right in there with them. I put those people that we love and, and rub shoulders with every day our good friends that aren't in the Lord's church. I have to put them in the middle of this. Twisted and perverted, or perverted would be twisted and distorted religious views. Uh, they don't know what they believe. What, just what you were just saying before, Bonnie. Uh, leave the Lord's church and go to a denomination. Twisted and distorted. They don't know. Now, some people might blame the preacher. And sometimes that might be right. But I want to tell you this. I have done, and I know Jay does, and I know Steve does, and I know you guys do when you're out talking to somebody. When I, when I would talk about morality in the church and the way people dressed, when they wouldn't listen, I said, now I want you to stop I want you to take your umbrella down because this isn't for somebody else. This is for you. When I'm talking about immorality and you wearing your blouses, ladies, too low, I want to tell you exactly what I'm saying so you will not misunderstand. I don't want to see any cleavage at all. None at all. And do you know what? They still... Act like they never hear you. The word was preached to these people. The word is preached to us. And we're not doing it. We're not taking it to heart. Now I hope you all study as hard as I study. Jay and Steve study. I hope you study that hard. But if you don't. And I don't say this braggingly. I just want people to open their eyes. If you can leave one of my Bible studies and wonder what I've been saying, you better go get fitted for a hearing aid. You better go get tested for Alzheimer's because something, and I'm not against Alzheimer people. Uh, I might know one of those very soon. But let's listen. Don't we care about Jesus dying on the cross? Don't we care about our salvation? Or are we going to fall in with this once saved, always saved group? I don't, I don't think so. Not me. Okay, let me, let me go on. Uh, in the midst of, of a crooked and perverse generation. Now, when he says generation there, he's not just actually saying a generation, what's a generation? 20 years? Something like that. We'll talk about the last generation. Those people who grew up in the last 20 years. That's not what he means here. What he's talking about here when he says generation, he's talking about in this crooked and perverse generation or nation, he's talking about their contemporaries. You're out here in a with people all day long, seeing people, working with them and everything else. You cannot behave this way in front of a crooked and perverse generation. They aren't going to come to Christ. They aren't going to want to return to Christ if they look at you and see that you're not a bit different than they are. You're murmuring. You're disputing. 
You're not above reproach. You're like the crooked and perverse generation that you're in. How many times, Jay, you've heard it as much as I have. Go call on somebody and you say, well, uh, uh, you talking about the Milton Church? Well, doesn't, uh, doesn't so-and-so go down there? And I'd rather they didn't say that. I don't want to hear the examples of those people they're about to give. Do we know that for the most part, our congregations are full of people that don't know what they believe and sometimes don't care what they believe because they don't live it. <laughs> They're going to be so surprised. They're going to be as surprised on the last day as those Muslims that think they're going to get 70 virgins and all the wine they can drink when they get before God at the judgment. They've mistaken what God's grace is. I'm glad it's there because not a one of us would be saved. But they're mistaken and they're going to be surprised on that last day when, you know, they've, well, I was baptized, God. Mike, what was that? What was that you told me a long time ago? You said a lot of Christians are like alligators. Do you remember that? They get baptized like an alligator is in the water and then they just crawl out of the water and lay down on the sand and that's all they do. You remember telling me that? No, you don't remember. You're just like I am. But anyway, that, that's what happens. And I love them. But we, we aren't going to get there on somebody else's shoestrings or coat strings. It's not going to happen. Get rid of all, the, and if you have people that are in it, and I know you do, let's convince them to get rid of all that tradition that they're following. Paul's saying, we've got to be true to Christ if we expect to win these people. Stop the murmurings. Stop the disputings. Stop being a person that somebody can bring reproach upon. Now, he says, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation or generation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. A better word there for world, a better translation would be universe. As he's talking here, he's talking about shining as stars in the universe. Let me see if I can see if I wrote that Greek word down. Yeah. He is picturing Christians as stars in the sky. Now the Greek word is postera. It's the same word that we get our English word phosphorus from. You light some phosphorus. In fact, I, Steve isn't phosphorus what these sparklers that kids it aren't, isn't, aren't they full of those? That's the bright part. That's man, that's what you see is the phosphorus burning in there. Um, he's saying that's what we ought to be like a sparkler. But better yet, he says, we ought to be like the stars in the sky. That's one of the reasons God gave them to, him, to us. Romans chapter 1. We, we won't know how to obey God, but we ought to know there's a God, and we ought to be looking for the way he wants us to obey him. He wants us to worship him by just looking at the stars, by just looking up there and seeing what's there. And you know, we've never, we haven't scratched the surface on how many are there. Every time they build a more powerful telescope, well, we'll look at that. There's stars up there that we didn't even know about. They'll never find all of them, not in this life. So he says, I want you, he's saying, I want you to shine as lights or as stars in the universe. Now, that means we've got to be different. We've got to be different. Look in verse 16. Now, here's what he wants them to do. He says, holding forth the word of life. Here's how you shine like phosphorus. Here's how you shine like stars in the universe when you hold forth the word of life. What is that? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the word of life is. And as we hold that forth to this dark world, it's, what's that saying? You're better off to light one candle than to curse the darkness. 
Can you, how many of you ever, how many of you ever took the tour of, I think it's a four and a half mile trip in Mammoth Cave? I think Mary has. Anybody else? Uh, it, it, four, four and a half miles, I think, or four and a half miles is what you go, I think. Uh, and right, I think it's right after you go through Fat Man's Misery, that's the spot where it's hard to get through, you come out in a big room that's full of the, let me see if I can get this straight, full of the stalactite, no, stalagmites in the ceiling that if the light was on, you'd see them and they would be glowing. But when you get in that room, the guide, the park ranger, He'll say, every light out. Every light. It is so dark, you can poke your finger in your eye. And I forget how long he said it takes somebody to go start raving mad if they're just locked up someplace where it's that dark. Darkness is bad. Can you imagine, in that cave, that mammoth cave, it's a pretty good sized room. Uh, can you imagine if somebody just lit one candle? If somebody just lit one match, the way it would light up that room. I mean, you probably couldn't read a book or anything, but the difference, the difference, and that's what he's talking about here. We need to be so different than the world that's coming in on us and doing all kinds of terrible things to us we need to be so different that we shine like phosphorus. We shine like stars in the universe. I, I mean, how, how much more pointed could Paul make this? And so many just don't seem to want to understand. Holding forth the word of life or the gospel of Christ, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. Now, I think this is a parenthetical expression. You know a parenthesis is just to add a little bit more to something that's been said. To explain what's being said. He wants them, he wants them, uh, he wants to be able to rejoice in the day of Christ. You know what he's saying? He said, I want you to be this way. I want you to shine so bright for Jesus that I can rejoice in the day of Christ. Now, the day of Christ means the judgment. It's used too many other places in the New Testament where it's crystal clear. And you always, you always, well, I won't say always, but the majority of the time that I know about, you go back to the first use the way that statement was used the first time in the New Testament, you, and it explained itself what it means, you can be safe knowing that that's what it's going to continue to mean because it all came from the mind of God. So what he's saying here is, I want to be proud of you in the judgment. Pride's not a wrong. The only time pride is wrong is when it's evil is when it's boastful. I mean, Paul said, uh, I'm proud in one thing. I'm proud in the gospel of Christ. Well, the same thing here. Same thing here. Paul wanted to be proud of them. He wanted them to be such Christians, he's going to go on to tell us, that his work would not be counted as nothing. That... His, his work would not be vain, he said. Let me go on. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice, or that I may be proud in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain. Now here he is again, using one of those examples from athletics, Olympics, whatever. He loved, Paul. Yeah, this is one way you can usually tell if Paul wrote it. Paul loves these metaphors out of the Olympic Games and such as that. Uh, they, the minute he said that I run in vain, he's saying, you lost. They're saying, you lost. If you ran in vain, you lost. You weren't any good. You didn't practice like you should have. You didn't perform like you should have. He said, 
I don't want to think I have run this race of bringing you to Christ and keeping you in Christ. I don't want that to be in vain. I want that to count for something. Jay, doesn't that make you feel good that those people that you've won to the Lord and immersed into Christ and brought along, doesn't it make you feel good that one day you're going to be able to stand there in front of God, in front of Christ, at the judgment, say, man, I'm proud of you guys. I am so proud of you. That's not why we do it. But it's, it's going to happen. It's, it tells us a little bit more here about what we can expect on the day of judgment. And the Bible's full of those things. We can know. We can know what's going to happen. We can know how we're going to be judged. We can know who's going to judge us. We can know what that judgment is going to be. We can know if we're going to be able to be proud of somebody because they've done something. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Now when he says labored, what he's talking about there, that word in the Greek means weary and exhausted. Do we really labor that hard for Christ? I don't. I don't labor that hard, but I pray about it constantly. God, give me more people to teach. Help me to be a better example. Help me, Father, to be bold. I really feel bad when there's somebody that, of course, I'm sometimes I'm trying to judge and make sure I've got the right time to say the right thing to the person that I'm talking to. I had that happen yesterday where I had a man come and was, he was talking to me and I thought, boy, maybe this would be the spot. And then I thought, no, he's just not ready for me to spring this on him yet, but I'm going to. I'm going to say it, but that just, it just something didn't seem right. But sometimes we're just not bold enough to do it any time. Who do we love the most? Those people? Our family? Or do we love Christ the most? We better love Christ the most. Uh, he says, I don't want to have labored in vain. Uh, when he's talking about run in vain, he's talking about his evangelistic and his missionary activity. Let's do verse 17 and then I'm going to stop. Yea, or but, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. What he's doing here, he's talking about the Jewish sacrificial system. And he's pointing out to them, if I'm going to be offered up because you have had the faith that I have taught you. He says, if I... And if, if I be offered up, now I think it was here, I get this mixed up with my class at uh, Pleasant Ridge. Uh, when he says if, there are various ways if is used, and I think we did it here. Yeah, we did do it here. When he says if I be offered up, that's an if clause that has a fact in it. He's saying if I be offered up, and I'm going to be. He's talking about his death. He says, if I be offered up, and I will be offered up. Now, and that's, he, he's talking here about a Jewish offering, uh, which had death of the animal in, in that uh, offering. Uh, yea, and if I be offered or poured forth, like in, in the Jewish system, before a certain sacrifice was done, they would take a glass of wine and they would pour it out along with, then the offering would come. In the Greek times, they mixed the offering, they poured it forth, and the, the point is, it was poured forth in either case. This is why, and I think there are some people, I don't think they make a good argument, but there are some people that would say, uh, talking about, they do it around the communion table, talking about Jesus' blood that was spilled for us. His blood, my friends, his blood was not spilled for us. Spilled sounds like somebody's grabbed a hold and shook him, and he spilled it. Accidental. 
There was no accident about Jesus dying for us. He didn't spill his blood. He was offered. He was poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice or on the altar. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, or because your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. In other words, if because of my work with bringing you people to Jesus and keeping you in Jesus, if that causes me to face death, and he says, it's going to, he says, it's worth it all. It's worth it all. Oh, I know we'll know that. I know we'll know that. I think we know it now. I think we know it now. Uh, now, I still have a problem. Uh, if I were to, if I were to have to, you know, Paul, Paul once said that he would give himself if the Jewish nation could be saved. I don't love people that much yet. Um, that, I think you might say that frivolously. I don't think Paul did. I think Paul meant every word that he said. But when I think, when I think about giving up my salvation for eternity so somebody else can be saved, you know, I don't know. I'm trying to be honest with myself. I wish that I loved souls that much. I am trying to love souls that much, but I don't think I do. I don't think I do. And God knows that, so there's no sense in me not saying what I'm saying. But Paul says, it's all been worth it all. Worth it all. Uh, will you mark uh, verse 18, please, Mary? We'll start with 18 next time. Questions, comments, tomatoes to throw. They're about ripe, aren't they? In fact, we've had a few ripe ones. Just don't throw cucumbers. They are too precious. That's when I know winter's here, when cucumbers are no longer on the vines. We look for them every morning. We eat them. I don't know how many cucumbers we eat a day. <laughs> we love them. Father in heaven, we thank you so much. Father, knowing you, we don't believe that you ask too much of us. Father, help us not to for help us, Father, not to misunderstand you and misunderstand your grace, Heavenly Father, for faith. Help us, Father, to, to know that what you promised will be a punishment, will be a punishment. What you promised will be a blessing, will be a blessing. Father, help us to take your word serious. Oh, Father, we want to be saved. We want our families to be saved. We want our friends to be saved. We want those that we don't even know to be saved. And Father, please help us to do our part. In Jesus' name, amen.